Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Focus Group Podcast. I'm Sarah Longwell, publisher of The Bulwark, and we are back, and we're back for the rest of the 2024 cycle. I've got so much Focus Group content from the summer that it was hard for me to decide where to begin. The decline of Ron DeSantis, swing voters and Joe Biden, the no labels disaster. But I figured we'd start with Republican frontrunner Donald Trump's legal troubles since he is essentially running for president in between arraignments. And if you followed this Republican primary at all, you know that Donald Trump has built up an almost insurmountable lead. You might say he has 91 problems, but Republican voters ain't one. Great line from my producers. Uh, The day he was indicted in Manhattan on March 30th, he was sitting at 46% in the real clear politics average of national polls, and Ron DeSantis was at 30%. As of this taping, that split is 57-13. So for the first two episodes to kick off this season, we've pulled from dozens of focus groups we conducted over the summer with Republican voters to understand how they were responding to Trump's mounting legal troubles in real time. But before we get into that, I've got a cool surprise to kick off the season. My guest today is Jake Tapper, host of CNN's The Lead. Jake, thanks for being on. So it should be, if I may, if I may improve upon what you're, it should be, I got 99 problems, but the base ain't one. Oh, Right. Oh, my gosh. So good. Right. Just, uh, okay. So good. Uh, I love workshopping this stuff together. Yeah, no, it's, great. I mean, we all we all work better with editors. Yes, that's right. Course. Yeah, that's right. And uh, and actually how the tables have turned. It's really I get to interview you for once, which is nice. <laughs> Uh, usually I'm just like in jeans on your show, uh, talking politics. We love it. I, you, I would have you on my show every day if I could. I, oh, I think what you do so is nice so I think what you do is so interesting and, and so well done. Uh, well, I appreciate that. But let's talk about your book to start because, okay. and I get it. My first question is the most pedestrian question anyone's ever asked you, but can you just tell me how you write a book? Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Sorry. I didn't, I didn't do the lead in. Cause I want to, you've got a new book. All the demons are here. All the, the demons latest- are here. A thriller that takes place in 1977. One of the characters is in a, is a, on evil Knievel's pit crew. The other one is working for a DC tabloid. And it's a it's about a lot more than just 1977, but we can we can. But you want to know how I have time to write books? I do genuinely want to know how you have time to write these books. So the 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 two basic answers to the two parts of the answer are one, uh, I I am very into structure, so I conceive of the plot, I adhere to the three arc structure, I I outline it. I'm an architect, not a gardener. George R R Martin of fire and ice into game of thrones he says that writers are either architects or gardeners i'm an architect i wrote i outline it all and then the second part is uh i divvy it all up into chapters and then i write at least 15 minutes a day and because i've divvied it up into chapters i know i go to chapter five and i know what my assignment is i know what i have to do what the characters have to do i'm in that chapter i you know and 15 minutes a day anybody can find 15 minutes a day in their day, no matter how busy you are. Yeah, you gotta eat, right? And, um, you know, at the end of the week, if that's all you did, that's an hour, 45 minutes, that's three or four pages, something, it adds up. You are banging out bestseller, best-selling thrillers on 15 minutes a day. Well, I mean, I, I, it ends up being a lot more than 15 minutes a day. I would think. I would but think. I'm just saying like, that kind of discipline is what it's about. It's like- yeah. It's like, oh, you know, if you exercise for 20 minutes a day, well, you end up you end up exercising for more than 20 minutes a day. But if you make that your minimum, it's it's more a reflection of the the dedication and the discipline. Yeah, I've heard that about the exercise. Uh, so listen, uh, so this is your third thriller, and uh, this one's like got it all. It's like 70s pop culture, politics, a murder plot, a popular entertainer that runs for president, which sounds right. a little bit familiar. Yeah. Uh, is like the fiction for you, political fiction, like a form of, I read political fiction as a form of escapism. Do you write it as a way to sort of, because the current reality of politics is hard or you just always wanted to write political fiction? Well, I always wanted to write fiction and because I know about politics from covering it and I also and I know about pop culture from enjoying it, I find uh, the, those two uh, topics that I play with a lot. I end up writing a lot because it's escapism and that's fun for me. But then I also end up writing a lot about what's going on today. Like often the books are, are are at least trying to make them resonant today. You know, they say history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. So the first book 
takes place in the 50s. That's the Hellfire Club. And it's about the Joe McCarthy era. But obviously, there's a lot of resonance about the Joe McCarthy era. And in fact, there's direct lineage. Joe McCarthy's protege was Roy Cohn. Roy Cohn's protege was Donald Trump. I mean, that, that's not a theory. That's not snark. That's just history. Yep. Uh, the second book in the series is The Devil May Dance. That takes place in Hollywood. That's about the Rat Pack. And a lot of that's just about Hollywood and sexism and L. Ron Hubbard and, you know, a lot of stuff that's still going on today. And then this third book, uh, yeah, there's an entertainer that runs for president and Evil Knievel has a lot of the Trumpian DNA. I mean, he was this showman, this salesman, this guy who shot from the hip and a lot of people found him really appealing. A lot of people didn't even understand remotely what those people found appealing about him, but he was a celebrity on the cover of Sports Illustrated, Rolling Stone, et cetera. And then the other plot in the book is that's so that's Ike. He's an AWOL Marine, very disillusioned about where the country is, which is also resonant to today because, you know, oh, late like 70s, it. you have Watergate, you have Vietnam. And the other character is Lucy, and she's an aspiring journalist. She loves, worships Woodward and Bernstein. And she gets hired by a Murdoch-esque editor starting a tabloid in D.C. And that is a lot about Rupert Murdoch, um, who obviously continues to wield his powers uh, in our in our world today. So um, the 19, 1977 was the summer of Sam. So that's the year that tabloid journalism really became a big deal in the U.S. It was huge in in England already, but it wasn't hugely successful in the U.S. But that's when the National Enquirer and the Star and the Daily News and the New York Post, et cetera, really became huge and had a big effect on American culture. Yeah, you know, I saw th this character of Lucy is pretty interesting. But did you because I saw you say somewhere that it was hard for you to write a girl. Uh, and well, I, I would say it wasn't it's, it, it's a lot easier for me to it's a lot easier for me to write a boy. Yeah. But um, uh you know, it's more of a challenge. I don't want to be presumptuous to, to say it's easy for me to write uh, a woman character. Um, but, but, and I had, a, I had a, a woman editor that That's I hired. What I read, yeah. Yeah. That I hired and, and she helped me, you know, by adding something, you know, adding things that would never occur to me, like a line about, you know, wearing cute boots, you know, so that's like, that's a, that's a phrase that's never come out of my mouth. Cute you boots, know what? But... Me neither. Me neither. But, uh, <laughs> but, but, I, I mean. but I do know what you mean. I do know what you mean. But I still, it still seemed like that Lucy character, you could, it seemed a lot like you, you or not like right. you exactly, but like the young journalist seemed well, like that, that was something easy. that would be easy. Yeah. Yes. So Lucy is the most, of all the martyr family, and the, bo the book is about this one family. Charlie and Margaret are the parents. They're the main characters in the first two books. And Ike and Lucy are the kids and they're in their twenties and they're the main characters in this third book of all the martyrs. I am the most like Lucy. I mean, you know, as a journalist uh, and I gave her all my most annoying habits, um, <laughs> the, the habits that reporters have of correcting people when they misuse a word or they're using a frost poem incorrectly or misunderstanding a Shakespeare quote, all that stuff uh, I gave to her. Telling um, them how to make their rap joke a little bit funnier. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That was just, for, I was just part of participating in the workshop. <laughs> yeah. You can't tell me that's not better. No, it's better. It's better. Yeah. So, um, I mean, the idea wasn't mine. The idea was genius. So anyway, yeah. um, and, but my point is just, we all, we all do better with editors. So I had, uh, I had Christina as my editor helping to make uh, the, the Lucy scene because the, the, the chapters alternate between Ike and Lucy uh, in first person. And so, you know, I, I just wanted to make each chapter seem as though they were written by different characters uh, and that one was written by a 22 year old woman and one was written by a 20 year old uh, former Mar or AWOL Marine. You know, in the same way, like Ike is a motorcycle expert. I've never driven a motorcycle in my life. And but I needed to make those mo motorcycle scenes. And there are a lot of them seem real. And I hired a, a motorcycle writer named Mark Gardner to go over my motorcycle scenes to make sure that it sounded like Ike knew what he was talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, and he helped me with that too. So we, you know, we all need editors and, you know, so Christina did that with making Lucy seem more like a woman. And Mark did that with making Ike seem like he knew a, you know, a, a piston from a kickstand. Uh, so this book is, is, is already doing uh, awesome. Uh, and you, you've got a fourth one coming out. Like you're already working on a fourth one. Hmm. I need to figure out what I want to do next. I, um, there's a fourth one I'm working on. 
but there, <clears throat> there are also a couple nonfiction ideas uh, that appeal to me. And I, you know, I wrote that nonfiction book, The Outpost, about um, 12 years ago about uh, Afghanistan. Outpost and there, is so good. And the thank you. And and there are a few um, there are a few military stories that I've learned about in the last year or two that I'm feeling kind of itchy to write about um, just because they're so compelling and interesting and about the world we're in now. I might, I don't know what I'm going to do. This is just me talking, but I might put fiction on hold for a bit and, and write, go back to nonfiction for a little bit. Uh, well, I got to tell you, Hellfire Club is right behind me when I do my TV hits from home. It's oh, like on right? my bookshelf. Yeah. If you nice. ever, uh, so I look forward to putting this one on my bookshelf uh, and, uh, and having a whole set in my, in my background for awesome. TV. Awesome. Um, all right. So I'm going to switch gears here. Yes, let's do and, it. And, uh, and I'm going to, I want to start by just throwing a statistic at you and our listeners. So we've been asking two time Trump voters all summer, uh, how the indictments made them feel about Trump. I know I, I, you, you sent me the, some of the stuff and it's fascinating. I can't wait to, to hear what, what, what you think about it. But so uh, 44, we talked to over 100 people, just over 100 people. Uh, 44 people supported Trump more as a result of the indictments. 48 neutral, didn't change how they felt about him. Only eight supported him less. Yeah. Uh, and I think that that, to me, was an answer to an ongoing question that lots of us have had sort of kicking around on these pundit tables of, well, won't the indictments make people potentially support him less? And the answer quickly revealed itself to be, uh, definitely not. And so I want to play a sample of this more camp, how they sounded. And almost all of these people for, for, are from a group that we did just the day after the Manhattan indictment. So the very first one where Trump was indicted, indicted for the payoff to Stormy Daniels. Um, and the vibe shift back to Trump was very abrupt and obvious. Let's listen. Almost like as soon as I heard the news, I felt like I'm supporting him even more. <laughs> Just for the fact that I don't like what's happening and for political persecution of someone, it could be any of us, if they can do it to Trump where he can defend himself, I can only imagine how it would be if it would just a normal person. Trump being the only candidate and ex-president who actually really cared about people without caring so much about power. You can't trust Republicans. You can't trust Democrats. Trump was the only one you can trust. That's why Democrats are going crazy trying to get him, and Republicans aren't doing enough to try and help. Yep. You know, if somebody's going to take a stance against something, you're not always going to be the one that uh, that's going to be popular. Um, but it is definitely making me more wanting to support than ever before. But I, because I think he's the right guy to have the job. Coming from another country where people get assassinated for not agreeing with the people who are in power. It's really scary that America is going that way. Mm -hmm. So I feel like I've never donated to a party, but I feel like I might just <laughs> like, it's the only thing I can do. Yeah, it's making me more of a fan. And as far as a mugshot or something, He's going to market the hell out of that. And every one of us are going to buy those shirts. And when we're root for him, we're going to be wearing them. <laughs> Who here trusts the DA that's investigating Trump, Alvin Bragg? How could we? He's a Democrat. Okay. So this is probably the earliest and best example of what I call the rally ran Trump effect. I had seen it also during the impeachments from Republican voters. Um, but I want to talk just for one second, then I want you to react this is the first group. This was the first group in a long time in which when we did a head to head from Trump to DeSantis, everybody went for Trump. And yeah. so for me, this was like a key turning point up until that point from basically 2022, uh, the November 2022 elections until this point, the groups had been breaking uh, 44, 26 for DeSantis. So more than half the time we were getting more DeSantis people. Uh, but after the indictment, that number has been 64 for Trump, 25 for DeSantis. And I don't want to treat the focus groups like polling, but I do want to emphasize how dramatic and clear this shift was. Were you surprised that it went this way uh, as a republic? Did you think the indictments were going to have an impact on voters? No, 
Um, I did not. Um, n- not on two time Trump voters. Um, uh, I, I, I do wonder uh, if there it will be different at all when evidence is presented at some of the uh, more serious um, cases by which I am not including Alvin Bragg's case. And you'll notice of the cases that you that were cited, the only one that was specifically cited was the Alvin Bragg case. Uh, which gives you an idea of how much of a gift that case, uh, its, um, its, its relative weakness, at least according to legal experts, uh, its relative lack of importance, according to, you know, in, in the scheme of things compared to classified documents and January 6th. Um, and, and it just really gives you an idea of why so many Democrats were were wringing their wringing their hair or pulling their hair and wringing their teeth about about what Alvin Bragg going first because it really made it seem as though look if the narrative is uh, they're out to get me and and then uh, immediately somebody comes over and like hits you um, uh, you know without provocation or with a, a relatively silly provocation right. Uh, it, it, it only bolsters your case. It is interesting. Um, I mean, some of the people, um, well, one at least one gentleman, like what he said is just like word for word, the kind of thing you hear from Trump or his son or like his staunchest defenders. Like you can't trust anybody. You can't trust the Democrats. You can't trust the Republicans. No one cares about us except Donald Trump. He's the only like literally um, like a really unreasonable position on 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 Donald. I mean, that's not reasonable. I'm let's let's say let's pause it for the sake of argument that supporting Donald Trump is in the mainstream and acceptable. And you can understand why people do it just just for the sake of this sure. argument. Um, to say he is the only human being in the world that cares about the American people. And you can't trust any other politician in America except for him. That is not political allegiance. That is something else. Um, And I don't know how you would describe it. I'm not a social scientist, but that is beyond uh, allegiance to a politician. That is something more socio-psychological. Yeah, but it's also kind of nihilism, right? A kind of nihilism that Donald Trump has really pumped into the ecosystem and a lot of sort of right wing media has helped to amplify. I mean, this is there's there's a very clear Tucker Carlson does this with the you cannot trust them. I am the only one you can trust. I am the only person. And I think this is like pervasive. It's from Trump and then pervasive in in right wing media. Right. But it also strikes me what to me, what was also very just crazy about how the tables turned Uh, that we were watching happen in real time was it was so clear that a lot of it was related to, it was like, because we actually saw the shift just a little bit earlier where when they went into Mar-a-Lago looking for the documents, right? Um, And people, there was a raid and it's just from here, then the indictments as they racked up. And I, I kept, there's a lot of conversations about the media's responsibility in this, right? And when I was punditing, I was doing my punditing at the time, I was like, one of the things that Donald Trump is going to be able to do because of the indictments, not that they shouldn't have been brought, but he is able to become a central player, right? He is the central player and the rest of the candidates who are defending him become these bit players in his central drama, right? And like that allows him to just, he's dominating the air. And you see a lot of criticism of the media being like, well, why are you talking about him all the time? Like, why is Caitlin Collins interviewing him on a CNN town hall? Why is Kristen Welker kicking off her meet the press debut with Donald Trump? And I I don't know the answer. Like there is clear that amplification of Trump's legal troubles and everything else help him. Well, can I, can well, how I are still... people supposed to, yeah, what, tell me. So. In 2015, I started doing State of the Union on su- the Sunday show. Yep. I, I now share it with uh, Dana, but at the time it was just me. And um, I wanted for my first one 
to do something big and splashy, right? I mean, that's what that's what Kristen did for her first Meet the Press. You want to do something big. And we pitched to Hillary Clinton, Marco Rubio, and Jeb Bush independently. Let me do my entire show about you. Not just a sit down about the issues of the day, but about who you are, your whole life, your, you know, everything about you that got you to this day. So for Jeb Bush, like, how did you meet Columba? Like, what were you doing in Mexico? For, for Marco Rubio, your parents' trip from Cuba, you know, your time as Florida Speaker of the House. For Hillary Clinton, everything. Tell us about, like, working in Texas, you know, to get George McGovern elected. I mean, you know, yes. Are there going to be a couple questions you don't like here and there? Are there going to be whatever? Sure, of course. But let's just do it. Let's just do it. All three turned it down. All three turned it down. Okay. I mean, that's fine. Whatever. I'm, I'm, but you know who's, you know who didn't turn it down? I mean, I didn't do a, a big biographical thing, but I sat down with Donald Trump then like the next week, I, the first week I ended up doing Bill, Bill Clinton, uh, for some Clinton global initiative thing or whatever. Um, but then like the next week we did a pre-tape with Donald Trump. We ended up not airing it because it was the horrible, um, um, church shooting in South Carolina. So we bumped it another week. Um, But I did a long interview with him. I challenged him on, I wore a Trump tie and it was made in China. You know, I did a whole bunch. Yeah. Yeah. I did a bunch of stuff, but my, my only point is people need to stop. Candidates need to like, I, all the complaints I'm hearing today, I heard in 2015 and 2016, you're friends with Tim Miller, right? Tim would, Tim and I would, would, Tim would yell at me and I would argue with him all the time. I would say, put Jeb on the show. Like, what do you want me to do? Like, I, I have a show to bear. I like, so, you know, we are constantly trying to get other candidates. Look, I'm, first of all, I haven't interviewed Donald Trump since 2016 when I pressed him on whether his going after Judge Curiel for not being able to do his job because he was a Mexican, even though he's from Indiana. Isn't that the definition of racism? In June, June, 2000, June or July, 2016, that was the last time I've been able to interview Donald Trump. So, you know, I can't be faulted for interviewing him too, too often, but you know, we're, we are, I'm not going to name names, but like, it's not as though, all of the other candidates with the exceptions of Asa Hutchinson and Chris Christie and, and, you know, Will Hurd are really making themselves available outside the Fox news bubble. They're yeah. not. And yep. like, I mean, like we're not coming at them with shivs. Like we're not like it's, we're a news organization. You know what I mean? Like I get not going on MSNBC, but like, why aren't you on ABC, CBS, NBC, uh, CNN, like NPR, like, There's lots of media out there, but they are focused on exclusively conservative media. And yeah, that's, you got to go there, of course. That's not where all the Republican voters are. You know that. Now it's definitely where some of the focus group people are. A hundred percent. You can tell which ones, the ones that only repeat the the talking points, but that's not all of them. Yeah. Uh, I'm really glad you made this point about like, it's also who says yes. This is something I've said. I mean, Ron DeSantis made a fatal error for himself. He decided just not to talk to people he didn't want to talk to. And frankly, one of the things that that fails to do is he, he's not very good at answering questions, right? He's not good at, at answering tough questions. And so when like the national spotlight came for him, he wasn't really ready for it. He didn't know how to do it. It's a huge mistake. In 2012, I was uh, in the White House press corps covering Obama. He had that first debate with Romney. You might remember Romney won decisively, I thought. And I remember thinking, that Obama had not given an interview to a tough interviewer in a year. It had all been like, you know, cozy, friendly uh, interviewers. And, and I, you know, that's just problematic. Yeah. And I, you know, no, I did get to do an interview with DeSantis um, uh, a few months ago. And I thought it was going to be like the kickoff of like, okay, like we proved that like, I can do like a, respectful sit down and you know let's just have a meaningful exchange of here's like six questions whatever and i thought it was going to be the beginning of like a ton of interviews like he was going to change his strategy and this and that but we haven't been able to get him back but at least Hmm. at least he got he did that interview 
I had Nikki Haley on uh, a couple Sundays ago, which was, you know, great. Oh, oh I should point out, uh, uh, Vice President Pence uh, uh, does say yes, too. He, he, he see, but he he, he kind of gets it also. Like, I have to say, like, he understands that there are Republicans who watch CNN yeah. and watch like the networks. There are like there are Republicans who turn on Fox and think like this, this is not news. I don't know what this is, but, you know, this is this is. You know, just yeah. like there, there are Democrats that turn on MSNBC and say, like, OK, that's fine. But like, that's. Yeah. And not to not to digress too much into this, but like one of the things what I hear in the focus groups all the time, you're right. Like you can tell a Fox News watcher, but one of the main uh, signifiers of somebody who is thinking more deeply about the issues is that they say, I also watch CNN and I also like they check in on other networks to see what different groups of people are saying because they are interested in a right. wide variety of viewpoints and those are the ones that are persuadable like if you're mike pence or if you're will hurt or if you're just about any of these guys who don't don't want the pure base uh that love donald trump which is now i am going to get off track and think about how desantis decided to just wrestle trump for his fox news sort of cult uh instead of looking at those persuadable voters that were interested in moving on to me, that was one of the big fatal errors. Actually, you and I are gonna you and I are gonna take each other down a whole political thing, and I I've got but some also, other focus group stuff to get to. Right, but also <laughs> DeSantis decided to try to run to, to Trump's right, which I right. still just don't like. He's still doing it. He's still run, trying to run to Trump's right, and I just don't think that there's room there. I mean, I, I mean, maybe there is. There maybe is not. There is. I mean, not. maybe maybe he will prove me wrong. But he I, he's making a play for evangelicals on Trump's right. Like, look, Trump is soft on abortion. Look, Trump is soft on trans, like in, in the way that would appeal to evangelicals. And I mean, I just don't know that those people are movable. I think that they're just with Trump. Yeah, totally agree. I also agree that most things are Tim Miller's fault. Uh, but <laughs> going so going yeah, back, I just I, just for the record, I was not arguing that most things are Tim Miller's fault. <laughs> not just me. I am. Uh, so uh, so I know it's not an indictment per se, but I wanted to run through how voters talked about the E. Jean Carroll verdict, because I also think this is instructive. Uh, so Trump was found liable for sexually abusing her. Uh, and I want you to hear how these two time Trump voters reacted to that. They didn't find him guilty of rape. They just found him guilty of something else. And what's $5 million to Trump? Did he do it? I don't know. Did he libel her? Probably. That's just, he speaks his mind and people don't like it. And they huh. get pissed. It was ridiculous. I could have been there and said he raped me. <laughs> I don't think there was enough evidence. I think they're blaming him for everything. I think she was very hazy as far as like details go. And I think mm -hmm. if we're going to follow through on this type of guilty verdict, that just opens the door for everything, right? Exactly. If someone could come out tomorrow about Joe Biden and say something, they got to stick to the same standard. Right. If you see any other videos of this woman, she looks a little, she, she's a very strange person and she's a little bit like delusional, weird. Even even that video of her doing the interview with uh, Anderson Cooper, they're like, come on, this really did not happen. Like a little bit of a, a money grab on her part. Uh, a lot of time has passed from the the event to now, but I don't know what took so long. You know, I can imagine a lot of things. The amount of time is ridiculous. I mean, that, that whole thing was so absurd. If you've ever been in Bergdorf, there's no way somebody could get raped right off the main floor there. Okay, so nobody believed that Trump did this in these groups. Go ahead. You were you going to say something or react? Well, Again, as, as somebody who followed this trial closely, I think if Donald Trump had actually put on a defense, he could have he could have probably won that case. I, I really honestly think this. I'm just looking at this purely. I'm not looking to to, to say this didn't happen. Okay, I'm not, and I'm not looking to deny somebody's truth or anything like that. And obviously, sexual assault and rape are serious issues. Purely as a legal matter, Donald Trump did not put on much of a defense. He did not testify in his own behalf. He 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 did a you know he he sat for a deposition and he said some ridiculous things in that deposition that definitely did not endear the jury to him. But she could not remember the month or even I believe the year when this took place, and you know. 
I, there were other weaknesses in the case that I think would have made that a difficult case to prove against somebody else in a different situation if they had defended themselves. Now, that's not to say I'm associating myself with anything sure. that was just said, but it's just to say that I know liberal, I have heard liberal women say that they had doubts about E.J. and Carol's story too. Yeah. And that doesn't mean I, that they are voting for Donald Trump. I mean. Yeah, I listen, and, and here's the thing. This is actually, I included this not to necessarily litigate E. Jean Carroll. It's more that it is interesting to me. Uh, so a lot of these voters, they were not following the E. Jean Carroll thing closely at all. So they weren't really differentiating. Oh, did he testify? Right. They were against it. But here, here's the, the thing is, is that, to me, that's interesting is that there's something in the news right today that is downstream of what I would call just a voters deciding that Trump's three times divorces, multiple right. sexual assault allegations, just the stuff we heard. And whether maybe that's let's stipulate, let's just pretend none of that's true. We still he's still on tape saying, you know, yeah. grab him by the privates. And he's still obviously oh, rude, crude yeah. and disgusting. But but then you see something like Lauren Boebert, right, yeah. in a in a in a in a play a musical i didn't know they'd made a musical out of beetlejuice i'm gonna have to see that uh and she is groping a guy he is groping her she gets thrown out for vaping and and fighting and it's just to me the permissiveness of the republican the average republican voter now the extent to which like E. Jean Carroll barely made a ripple. That's what that's what I think is sort of interesting to me. And maybe it's the credibility of her story and lots of people weren't going to litigate it. But maybe it's also just that, like, of all of the things that people care to, are going to care about, like, nobody cares about whether or not Donald Trump sexually assaulted somebody because their standards on morality have ceased to exist in the Republican Party. I do find it stunning. I Let, let me put it this way. I have a friend... I, I am a person of faith. I'm Jewish and I was bar mitzvahed and I go to temple and my kids were bar mitzvahed, bar and bat mitzvahed, and uh, my wife converted to Judaism and all that stuff. And I have a friend who is an atheist, one of my best friends. And he said to me something along the lines of, we had this conversation the other day before I interviewed Pence. And I almost asked Pence this, but we ran out of time. Um, he said, I disagree with Pence on everything, but you cannot tell me that that guy is not a, a sincere man of faith, that he does not truly believe uh, in his religion, in his faith, and that he does not walk the walk, that he does not live his life according to what his faith instructs him. And evangelical Christians, conservative, to be specific, as I know you would want me to be, conservative white evangelical Christians have an opportunity right now to vote for somebody who represents them more closely than anyone since, you know, Pat Robertson. Yep. And they are not even giving him a look. Right. They are all about Donald Trump, who nobody even really believes has any kind, and he, and he doesn't even really pretend anymore. I mean, the two Corinthians thing is funny, but like um, two Corinthians walk into a bar. And, um, but beyond that, just like how he lives his life, you know, remember when Mark Halpern was asking him what his favorite verse in, verse in the Bible was? Yeah. I mean, all you have to do is say Jesus wept. It's just two. It's just two words. But, <laughs> it's but the shortest I mean, sentence in the English language. Yeah, it's not even my book, and I know that. And and <laughs> but but yeah, I mean, it's just it's just remarkable to me. And and the degree to which some of the most pious people in the government, in terms of uh, attacking the left, people who are not Christian people who are not secular, people who, who are secular, people who are LGBT, uh, people who are anything other than conservative Christians, conservative evangelical Christians, really, because sometimes there's even like anti-Catholic bias in yep. there at Bob Jones University and, and other place, anti-Mormon bias when Huckabee ran for president. Um, 
the degree to which there is just rampant hypocrisy when it comes sorry, to just Romney when Romney ran for president. Rom, uh, yeah, but Huckabee and Romney. But Huckabee Mormon? No, no, but Huckabee's Huckabee's supporters went after Romney for being oh, Mormon. And okay. Huckabee Huckabee like used code on occasion for when he was going after Romney in two thousand uh I guess eight. This I guess this is in two thousand eight. Okay, wow. Yeah, there's half to you're young, but like you go back, there's <laughs> there's like little things that I would never have picked up on, but like terms and words that he was used to like send the right. signal to like don't believe that don't there's no you know latter day saint kind of thing. Anyway, yeah. my only point is by the way, Huckab Huckabee is probably a more recent Christian conservative than Pat Robertson. But in any case, I digress. My point is just like the degree to which some of the most pious people in the world are living lives of just rampant infidelity uh, is just remarkable to me. I, I, it's stun It's stunning to me. Not that it's that it's done, but there is like no accountability. No anymore. accountability, and that's no. it. Like Bobert, Christy Nome is like. I mean, it's just it's one after Marjorie the other. Marjorie Taylor Green. Marjorie, Marjorie Taylor, Taylor Green. We are we are drowning uh, in people, and this is Romney's retirement really underscores this. Uh, we are drowning in people who lack all conviction, except when they are condemning their enemies. Uh, they do not either hold themselves to those standards or their colleagues. Um, and I think it's more to me what is interesting about the E. Jean Carroll commentary from the voters is how much it seems like it just doesn't matter about behavior anymore. And this is what it's I all mean. tribalism. All totally. All of it. And I do not understand it. I really don't. Just as an American, I don't. Yeah. Um, as, and as a journalist who tries to play it straight and tries to be honest, um, I, I, I don't I don't get it. I really, truly don't. I mean, I, you know, I don't get it when people on the left pretend that, you know, Hunter Biden is this, you know, businessman of the year. And, and I don't I don't <laughs> I don't I don't get it on the right when. You know, when there's like when when I mean. There are members of Congress who act as though they're pious Christian conservatives get caught not not being that. And there's zero ramifications for them. Zero. Yeah. And if a journalist and journalists don't claim anything, right, in terms of our private behavior, we no one unless we're like on the hypocrisy beat, no one no one says anything about us. I mean maybe it's different if like you're an anchor and like, you know, whatever, but like generally speaking. If a journalist did the same thing, well, like we'd be hounded off the air. A lot yeah. of us, not, except on that one channel, right? That's but, true. Because well, accountability doesn't, uh, that whole ecosystem, no, no, it, it lacks accountability. No. Speaking it's, speaking of sort of the, the psychology of all this, I just want to go to the Mar-a-Lago Mar classified documents case. Um, because as a legal matter, unlike Eugene Carroll, the consensus tends to be that they've got Trump pretty much dead to rights. Um, but I think this documents case is really important to how Republican voters think because they take a big psychological off-ramp from caring about this stuff. And I want to I want you to listen to what this sounds like, but you've heard it before. It's it's to the tune of what about. It frustrates me that it doesn't seem to be like equal amount of uh, resources being um, devoted to looking into Hunter Biden's laptop. Well, you have a current president who is sicking all of the DOJ on a potential candidate. That's never happened. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Unless you're in Venezuela or, right. you know, a country like that, which is kind of well, scary, yeah. too. If it's against the law what he did, then let's apply it equally against everybody else that had documents. Hillary Clinton, Mike Pence, Obama, regular Clinton, and especially Biden. So I just feel this is just a bunch of bull just to bring him down. But, you know, they got the wrong person this time because he's not going to give in. That's what we like about him. Other presidents that have left office have had classified documents. They were not treated the same way as Donald Trump is being treated. It is a two-tier justice system in this country. It's just nakedly partisan. And uh, like to me, weaponizing the FBI against a political rival is just like beyond the pale. I never thought I'd see the day where that would be something. Most of us are just so sick to death and have become deaf because of the constant crucifixion of Trump and this has gone on now for so many years that we just don't even hear it anymore. Has anybody thought of Martha Stewart when you see this going on, how she was made to be the example? You know, they, they kept saying it doesn't matter what you did. It's the fact that you did it, you know.
a jury could very well find him guilty and he may very well be guilty. But why are they going after him and not everybody else? If they're going to go after him, I want to see him go after the Clintons and I want to see him go after Biden. And there's been others. They think Biden kept the things in a safe place because he had him next to his Corvette. So it's interesting that, when that, that woman used the word crucifix crucified. Oh, yeah. A uh, lot of a uh, lot of yeah. Jesus imagery associated with Trump often in the focus groups. So now that Hunter Biden has been indicted uh, yeah. on the gun charge, uh, I do not anticipate a bunch of the focus group participants suddenly believing that the justice. No, no. Now they them. say, well, that's but that's not enough. That's right. That's uh, James Comer has already uh, has a, uh, Chairman Comer has already like changed the he's moved the goalpost to like in, until basically until. President Biden is indicted. It's all just a smokescreen, a whitewash. I mean, yeah. that, you know, they, they just keep changing it. Um, yeah, look, I mean, these are people who this is the this is the problem with. And this is one of the reasons that I wrote what I did in in All the Demons Are Here and the whole thing about Murdoch is like this is the problem with a news media that is not devoted to actually just trying to get the facts and the truth out, regardless of who they favor this is about uh you know but it's just about fear or outrage and preaching to the choir the reason fox ended up paying that settlement for 787.5 million dollars to dominion and they're going to have to pay more to other individuals and other voting systems and such is because that they were so swept up in trying to pe preach to the choir to those people who only wanted to hear lies that they feared telling the truth would cost them viewers and or money. And then for good reason, because it would have, because they have been not informing their viewers for so long and not providing the whole context. Yes, of course, it is true that classified documents were found in Vice President Pence's uh, house and in President Biden's house, like I think, and I think it's correct, near the Corvette. It is also true that Pence turned them over and I think that case has been closed. Uh, there, is, there is a special counsel investigating Biden and those documents. We don't know what they're gonna conclude, but that office is the one that alerted the National Archives. And there's been cooperation by Pence's office, by Biden's office, by other offices that have, you know, I forget if it's Carter or Bush or Obama or whatever. It, it does happen that classified documents accidentally get taken and then they get returned to the National Archives. But this was not that. Right. This was classified documents purposefully taken by Trump who thought that they belonged to him, argued they belonged to him, and refused to turn them over for more than a year, despite legal entreaties to turn them over. All the, the of the, you know, last minute of what I just said is not included in when the when the Fox does their reporting on this, they just say, well, you know, Pence and Biden also have this problem. Does that and frustrate you that there's that asymmetry where like you and other mainstream media outlets, you know, you works, you're working really hard to bring people uh, credible news that they can trust. And then there's a whole other ecosystem in which accountability, like they're not trying to do that. They don't even really make yes, but if, much play about it. Yes. And, 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 but I should also note, and, and this is, I don't want this to be misunderstood. I am not equating progressive media with Fox. Okay. I'm not, or the right wing media because the yeah. right wing media, the lies about, the election, the lies about and the racism. I'm not saying it's equivalent, but the progressive media that thinks that no one should ever interview a Republican right. or that any Republican is treasonous and um, any discussion on any issue that isn't just the Democratic Party line is right-wing hackery and and that sort of coverage also bothers me because it infects how people view journalists that are doing a 
different job than than ideological media. There's always been a place for ideological media in the United States. It's it's in our roots. It's in our history. Back to when there were newspapers, one for the you know for the Federalists and for the Democrat Republicans. But it is dangerous when ideological media is presented as straight news and the others are not telling you the truth. And, um, and a lot of it's, by the way, entirely about commerce, not even about ideology. Right. And it makes it so if I have a civil interview with any Republican or Democrat and let them talk, uh, there are people who are conditioned to not like it, not trust it. And it's all to me bad, but yes, the Fox stuff bothers me more because obviously it really did a lot of damage to the country as we saw on January 6th. Speaking of January 6th, uh, I want to talk about the federal January 6th case. Uh, this is probably the most morally serious of all the indictments that came down this summer, which meant that Republican voters did the most to tune this one out. Let's listen. It's become quite boring. You know, you hear it. OK, another one. Who cares? But that's kind of what the Democrats and the media did for four years. I mean, every day it was something to the point you just block it out. Take a look back at our last handful of presidents. Find me an honest one. Um, <laughs> all the way back to LBJ, Kennedy before him, et cetera, et cetera. Eisenhower might have been the last honest one. And there are questions about him. If he was not running for president, there would be no charges. I mean, why are they bringing these charges three years later? You know, right. right. If he wasn't running, there would be nothing. It's all trying to just smear him and get a bad name so he doesn't get back into office. Because they can't control him. Yeah. I don't know that I actually care because it's just another one. I mean, it's just, just another reason to create a, a news cycle. It's another reason to just make him sound like he's the worst person on the planet. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I just I'm actually kind of tired of it. I don't know how he keeps rolling with it. So I think there was a period of time where a lot of us thought that maybe the accumulated weight of the indictments would start sort of chipping away at people. But instead, when I listen to these voters, especially people like the last one, I heard this all the time after the January 6th one. It was like, I'm bored. I'm tired of it. They're all running together in my head. Mm -hmm. um, they can't tell them apart. Um, and so what do you do when like, yeah, he's going to have all these cases. Like you're going to have to cover the 2024 cycle and he's going to be in court all the time. The voters can't really tell each of these. They can't differentiate them. They just they just lump it together as one intense effort to get Trump. And that in itself is the evidence that Trump is the one that everybody fears. Yeah. So I don't know that any of those people are gettable for me in terms of the news broadcast I do. I mean, I don't think any of them are looking for an objective news report about, you know, what's going on in the world, what's going on in the country, et cetera. Like I, you know, I, I, the, my guess is that they're, they like partisan media that tells them that Joe Biden's awful. The cities are Democrat run hell infested rat holes. And, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm aware of what right wing media looks like all that. Um, but all I can do is explain the seriousness of the charges against Trump or the lack of seriousness in the case of the New York case. Um, you know, trying to undermine democracy is a pretty serious thing. The evidence against Trump is pretty strong. Uh, and I don't, you know, I don't know what's going to happen. Obviously everybody is innocent until presumed guilty, um, or presumed innocent until found guilty, but, but, um, you know, this is serious stuff. We we do make an effort to try to distinguish with graphics and with language, you know, not to be just, you know, there is the New York case that's about hush money. There's the Atlanta case. It's about January 6th, the federal case about January 6th, and then the classified documents case. And, you know, we have graphics and try to help people understand the difference between them. One thing I'll note about the arguments about the January 6th case that we just heard from your focus group there there was nothing substantive against them, as opposed to 
what I heard substantive arguments against the Alvin Bragg case, the Gene Carroll case, some of the other things, because there really isn't much of a substantive argument against the prosecution in the January 6th case. You can talk about whether it should be federal or state when in the, in the Fulton County case, you can talk about all sorts of things, but I mean, we all saw it happen with our own eyes pretty much. Yeah. And this is this is interesting to me to go through the indictments and even listen to different people's rationalizations, because I think they they sort of form a chorus of a lot of different strains of rationalizations that I've heard uh, over all of these last years. You know, it's either that, oh, come on about the Alvin Bragg case, like big deal. He paid hush money to a porn star. And then you've got your what about in the documents case, which is a classic sort of thing. Right. Uh, and then uh, you've got the no, I have followed the E. Jean Carroll. And here, let me tell you why she's wrong about this. Or I just think she's a weirdo. Um, and then but once you get to the one that like they don't really have a comeback for. And this is January 6th. It's, it's just like I'm tired of talking about this. I'm bored. We should move on. It's over. Uh, by, the, by the way, I mean, and the, the whole thing about we should move on. There is no one that talks about January 6th more than Donald Trump. That's right. I mean, probably even, you know, I, I think Donald Trump talks about it more than Jack Smith uh, yeah. and Fonnie Willis, uh, the Fulton County District Attorney. But um, so, I mean, D Donald Trump, as far as I can tell, m much of his 2024 campaign is predicated on the fact that he actually won the 2020 election and, and that, I mean, that that's what he's, that's what he is running to as a, as a sort of vindication about. Uh, it's not, I don't hear much in terms of policy. I know there's, there's policies on his website, but like in terms of what he talks about at these events. So I don't know. I, but you forgot to mention, by the way, in addition to covering all these trials and the primaries and the caucuses and the debates and all that, we're also going to be covering uh, an impeachment inquiry which is obviously going to lead to an impeachment proceeding. Um, Joe Biden. Yeah. No, you think if anybody out there thinks that Speaker McCarthy is launching an impeachment inquiry that ends with Joe Biden's name being cleared, then uh, I'd like to meet you and have- You got a, a bridge? You got a bridge a, you can sell? A, no, I'd just like to have a sip of whatever you're drinking. <laughs> Well, you mentioned uh, Georgia and Fulton County, and I want to end, I kind of want to wrap up with that, um, because this is the one where Trump and 18 others were charged with violating Georgia's racketeering statute. Uh, and among other things, Trump was charged with soliciting Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger uh, to violate his oath of office. Let's listen to this one. It's like if they try to make an example out of him. What are we going to do about the Bush v. Gore case? Like, in essence, that's also trying to overturn an election. So I don't think we should be able to be in a country where we can't question the validity of something that was so widespread. I mean, I think it's ridiculous. And they're really scared of him. And we've never had someone like Trump trying to clean up everything like he has been. So I think everyone is just scared to death because they know he's going to come back with a vengeance. So they're trying to just prevent in any way, shape or form, no matter how ridiculous it is from him getting back in the White House. I think if I were him, I would feel a little bit cheated because wasn't there a lot of issues with them mailing ballots to people that have maybe been deceased <laughs> or, you know, maybe to the wrong address? Like, I mean, there could be a lot of different variations as to how that could have negatively impacted the election. And I feel if if something was taken away from me that I felt like was owed or earned, I think I would fight as hard as he did. So I try to put myself in his position. I don't know that I would be committing <laughs> felonies or anything like that, but I, I could understand why it seemed like it had been taken away from him or it wasn't fair. There is a two-tiered justice system, as we've all heard buzzwords, but it's almost like they're mirroring. They're saying you're doing this, but they're actually the ones really doing it or have done it. I haven't actually gone back to the recording, but I've seen the transcript, and I do not believe that he was asking Raffensperger to somehow manipulate the situation and come up with the votes. As I understand it, he needed a certain threshold or number of votes to be considered for a recount. And I think the number that he represented was like 11,790 something. And then he added one. So they, they knew that they needed like a 10% variance or something. And he was asking for the 10% variance plus one to be discovered. I mean, he's not the 
most eloquent speaker, and I think it's very easy to manipulate what he's saying, but I don't believe that he was blatantly asking Raffensperger, hey, you know, go out there and pound the pavement and dig up some more votes for me. I think that he was honestly trying to ask for, you know, please asking for scrutiny and accountability rather than like manipulation. And I don't think when Trump said, find these votes, that he was saying, go manufacture votes. He was saying, I believe that the votes are out there and I want you to do your job. And I think that Raffensperger thought that he was and was standing up for himself. So I guess he's okay. Um, I wouldn't say that he's a strong advocate for the Republican Party, but I don't think he's a villain either. That last guy actually voted for Raffensperger, uh, I should note. Um, but it's just, it's just so, it's just, I mean, it's just so remarkable. I mean, I, you know what I was thinking about when you were playing that? I love my wife and my son and my daughter dearly, dearly. I would not defend them to the degree that these people defend Donald Trump if presented with evidence of wrongdoing. I mean, I wouldn't. I mean, I would say, you know, my son's name is Jack Jack you know that you stole that candy bar from the CVS and now you're going to, like, I saw you do it and you're going to have to pay the consequences. I mean, like he, he doesn't steal candy bars from CVS, but, but <laughs> really throwing your kid under the bus there, but <laughs> he doesn't do it. But my, but, but it's just, it's like, I, I don't, I get, look, I, I, I get it. I'm a journalist, so I don't feel this way towards politicians. I don't feel this way towards anybody. So I can't even, I can't remotely understand how anybody is that allegiant to any politician. But I'm not, I, I, I mean, it's just like the, who are you going to believe me or your lying eyes? Like. So, so let me ask you on this, now that you've, I, I've, I've sort of tortured you as some people suggest I do with these focus groups quotes uh, with, with the, the series of rationalizations from all the different indictments. Yeah. Do you, do you now going in, do you think, there's anything that would change voters' minds about Donald Trump, Republican voters' minds? I think no matter what, uh, at least 42, 43% of the electorate's going to vote for Donald Trump. And no matter what, 42, 43% of the electorate's going to vote for Joe Biden, period. And uh, as you know, the vote, the, the fight is about all, the, all those others, and more specifically in six or seven states. And um, the question is, what is the aggregate impact of, you know, inflation, uh, Trump's age, I mean, um, Biden's age, Hunter Biden, you know, all the negatives and the positives for Biden and all this other stuff for Trump, whatever people feel is good for Trump. Um, and, you know, and then throw, you know, abortion into the mix. And the first yep. time we're going to see that in a presidential ever, the idea that Roe v. Wade is gone. Um, and, you know, I, I don't think any of those people are persuadable, period. The, the only question is whether or not they would ever vote for DeSantis or Nikki Haley or Tim Scott. And, and you know... And, and, and to be and to be fair to the Trump opponents, it's a pretty strong bench. I mean, like those are. I mean, I, they're. Not, I wouldn't say they're necessarily giving Trump a run for his money, but like Nikki Haley, Tim Scott, Ron DeSantis, the others, Chris Christie, Asa Hutchinson. Like this is this is not you know the seven dwarfs. These are this is this is this is strong bench of Republican candidates. Maybe some of your listeners don't like any of them, but like. They're accomplished, they're charming, they're, you know, whatever. But there's just something about the hold that Donald Trump has on the on the base right now that is that is just um, it defies. It's not even about the media. Well, it, it is about right wing media and the lies they tell um, for the sake of money and grift and ratings. Um, but beyond that, and it is about, by the way, also about like mainstream media and the degree to which we are shockingly honest with our viewers to the point of risking bothering people on the left or the right. 
Um, but beyond that, it's just like the we're in very I I I we're in unprecedented times. Okay. Uh, well, Jake Tapper, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and everyone, make sure to order. All the demons are here. You can find an easy link to buy it in our show notes. Uh, Jake, it was so great to have you here. I loved it. Uh, we really appreciate you doing this. Yeah, right, come on the lead soon. Talk to you soon. And thanks to all of you for listening to the Focus Group podcast. We'll be back next week to check in on the rest of the GOP field that Jake was just talking about. Don't miss it. <laughs>